so the name of today's talk is Yin Yang and Dao Jia in Systems Thinking Through Changes. And let me explain what actually happened and the way we got into this is uh, we're focused on systems thinking and the idea of system changes came up and uh, it, it's actually been popular recently. So in effect, we asked the question, is systems thinking different from systems changes? System changes different from system thinking. Uh, and as we worked on it, we started looking into alternative approaches, and it turns out that um, Chinese philosophy is based on change, and it's different from a Western approach. So I've been going to a Chinese doctor for um, 30 years, and uh, it's only recently that I've been looking into it, and it's like, oh, okay, so um, this is a, a scientific approach into Chinese philosophy, and it's focused on yin yang. Some other people might say that it's related to the Tao Te Ching and related to Taoism, but I'm going to try to keep back a little bit in science, and I'll, I'll explain that. Okay, so um, I'm going to go over the welcome. Uh, we did the icebreaker already, but I'll kind of explain the reasoning about why uh, I, I wanted this icebreaker about asking people about what science they come from. Um, then we'll go through three different ideas um, and we'll have the presentation, dialogue, and reflections on them. And I'll explain them a little bit more as we go along. So this is me. Uh, so this is 1964. This is in Gravenhurst, Ontario. Uh, my grandfather and father were partners in a Chinese restaurant. Uh, only Chinese family in a town of 3,000 people. And uh, so I lived with my grandparents until I was 10. I uh, would have spoken only Toisan, the Cantonese dialect, um, until I was five and then went to school and at school they said, oh, you have to speak more English and so we switched. And then later on when I went to University of Toronto, I lived with my grandparents. Uh, so there's this background of being uh, Chinese and, and having that heritage, but I'm totally Western trained. You know, I went to school in Canada, so you, you speak to me on the phone and you can't see me, you go, oh, this guy doesn't have an accent. So yeah, so that explains it. So a lot of this I'm doing is, is recovering a lot of that. So just to give you a quick history of myself, there's kind of four sides to me. Uh, one is the commercial side, the biggest one, which was uh, IBM for 28 years. Uh, at the beginning and the end, I'm working in the family business um, that uh, my father owned a furniture store. And so he, when I was a child, I worked in the retail store. And now I'm winding it down. Um, I've done a lot of research, start off in decision support systems and moved over in effect to system thinking, system sciences. Uh, I've taught at various places, the Rotman School, um, uh, I've taught in Finland, I've taught in China, um, I've taught at OCAD U recently, and um, I'm a family guy, so I am a husband um, for the all, almost the whole period, and um, recently I've become an in-law. My sons are all grown up now. So, on science. There are four world theories, and this is by Stephen C. Pepper, and he calls them world hypotheses because uh, Pepper is down the, uh, the line of pragmatists, American pragmatists, going back to the metaphysical club. And it's in the origins back to uh, William James. And um, he's in that lineage. And so the reason he says world hypothesis is pragmatism is based off doubt. It's a philosophy of doubt. And so he says, well, you can't really have a theory. We have a hypothesis that may turn into a theory. But when we approach the world, he says, in effect, there's four ways of looking at it. The first one is formism. And so when we see something in the world, we say it looks like something else in the world. And so that's how we understand our world. The idea of similarity is the root metaphor. Um, and so an example he uses in the book is a, one piece of yellow sheet of paper is like another yellow sheet of paper. It was like, how do you actually make that a description that it's yellow or it's the right size or these sorts of things. But we very commonly use that as one form of knowing. Going to the right, there's a mechanism where the root metaphor is a machine and you exert force or energy and you produce an outcome. So this one has time now, moving things from one place to another. And so a lot of science is based that way. And so we think about things as machines and often we describe organizations as machines. And for the most part, they are organized. Corporations today, modern corporation is organized as a mechanism. Going down, we have organicism. 
And organicism, it actually is not supposed to be organic. It's not supposed to be strictly biological, but the root metaphor is constructive development. And you get the changes of things happening from stage to stage. And so you have the idea of parts that become a whole eventually. And that's a lot of what system thinking has been doing, is trying to move from mechanism into organicism. And you see a lot of descriptions like that. There's this other one, though, that is a little bit misunderstood called contextualism. And contextualism is, uh, the, the firstly, the, the straightening out of the word, contextualism is actually about texture. It's not about text. And so you're thinking about things that weave together. The root metaphor is a situation as a historic event in its living actuality. So the idea, and you'll see this as we go along, would be as threads over time that kind of tie together into a situation. In this case, when you look at time, it's a qualitative duration. So it's, it's how we feel. It's not like being on a clock. And so those are the four that are from 1942. And there were other world hypotheses that came along, um, but no one else actually picked up on this. So what I've been proposing in my research work is a new idea of contextualism dyadicism, where we combine some of the elements of contextualism and organicism into, uh, into a, a world view that has something like tidescape and windscape, where you have more nature and things blowing and they're not deterministic. Um, you have the idea of time as kairos, which is felt time. And so a lot of this is built into or comes from through the Chinese philosophy, and um, we'll get into that a little bit. So when I asked what sciences have most shaped your experience, so as I was explaining, a lot of people explain the world in the physical sciences. And so you can look at the top of this list, and it's astronomy and geoscience. So they go to the bottom of the list, and they go mathematics or logic. Uh, and you move up to physical sciences, those tend to be more mechanistic sorts of orientations. In the life sciences, clearly it is an organicist. And then you get to the social sciences, and then you go, well, sometimes you look at it contextually, sometimes people look at it in an organic, organicist way. So there's different ways of looking at it, and all of us are trained in, in all of these. We all got, went to high school, so we're all trained in all of these. But what happens is that when we start working, we start working in more than, more than one way or the other. We tend to lean to one, to one or the other. So work on this idea. I right, talk about, uh, let me just back up for a second, make sure I clear that. Um, so the, the first idea we're going to talk about is linear movement as monadic, so that's ones, to rhythmic complements as twos. So this is one of the fundamental differences between the Western approach and the uh, Chinese philosophy is in Western philosophy, if you stop and think about it, we always end up with one, like the atom. We're always looking for the particle, the smallest thing. But in a, a Chinese philosophy, we're looking dyadic. It's always two things. And this is where the yin-yang will come in. So we think about ancient Greeks and the way that we do Western science. A lot of it is focused on straight lines and moving from point to point. So we have a today and we have a tomorrow or we have a current state and we have a future state. And there's a lot of focus on getting off on that straight line. The difference with the Chinese philosophy, the classical Chinese philosophy, is that, firstly, it's rhythmic. And so you have that wave going on. But it's not just one wave. It's actually two waves happening simultaneously. So in this case, we could call the blue wave as yin and the brown wave as yang. And they counterbalance each other. And so this is uh, pretty hard, and this is, this is difficult to, uh, for people to um, work their way through because it's not like on the left where you can have a point and then freeze it at you know, either the beginning or the end. It just continues over and over time. So the questions you, you end up dealing with is if everything's changing all the time, when is something like a real change or a significant change? So let me try to uh, unpack a little bit more about yin and yang. So people are probably familiar with the Daiji symbol here, which is yin and yang. But the way that we should think about it, if you look on the outer edge here, uh, well, look first. So the the yang is the white or the brightness part, and the yin is the darkness part. Um, but if we look at the way that we put this on a clock, because it's actually a circle, at 12 noon you have utmost yang. So this would be if you want to do day and night. Uh, that's when it's brightest, and then uh, at 
the bottom, you have 12 a.m., you have utmost yin when it's the darkest. But what's actually happening when you're looking at yin and yang, and the reason it's in the swirl, is that it actually is a transition. So it's not that you should be focusing on noon and midnight, it's that you should be focusing on the change as it goes around the circle. If you look at what they've done in Chinese, uh, classical Chinese medicine, so here's a uh, depiction of the organs in your body as they go through the day. So at 6 a.m. you see large intestine. And so for those of you who travel a lot and you get jet lag, you're in Europe and you're waking up at 4 a.m. or whatever, um, these sorts of things are because your body clock has not caught up. And so I remember going to Asia and always waking up. First, you wake up 4 a.m. and then wake up 4.30, 5. And that's your large intestine. Your large intestine and your bowels wake you up. Um, and you can slowly get that shift. Um, but another example would be uh, that all these, these all get stronger and weaker. And so at noon, the heart is strongest. And what it, they would say in Chinese, uh, in Chinese medicine is that at noon, you are at the greatest risk of heart attack. More heart attacks happen around noon because that's when that organ is dominant. Now, if we generalize this into, uh, into more of a worldview, just away from the body and the human body, one of the misunderstandings is about the saying yin and yang. They exist with each other, but qi is an atmosphere that's both matter and not matter. And this is confusing because in the Western world, and particularly after Newton, we have mind and body. And they go, well, and that doesn't really happen in Chinese philosophy. Um, but the way you look at it is if you look at from the top, you have this arrow of qi in concentrating mode. So if you think about greater yang up at the top being heaven, that's one way of looking at it, and at the bottom it's earth, you have a transition and a movement of the qi in concentrating mode. So the heavens concentrates into earth. And then on the other side, you have earth transitioning back into um, heaven. And this is another way of depicting it. And this is for seasons of the year. So in summer, you can see that it's very bright and the dark circle in the middle is very small and it reverts. And so you can see that's a different way of looking at the diagram. Now, trying to convert this circular into motion, um, this, is, this diagram is helpful because you're actually looking at two, two sine waves that are out of phase. And so you can kind of see now what, what's happening is that the way we should be thinking about yin and yang is as waves that go and they alternate with each other. But they have this idea of dissipating and concentrating. So when we talk, uh, talk about yang, which is the heaven, and yin, which is the earth, we can go down and create correspondences with that. So yang, yang they usually say is light and dark, but it's better to say it as a verb and say illuminating or darkening. So you have working and resting. And the idea that, you, that you're working and resting would be in what they call uh, diachrony. It's not synchrony, it's diachrony. Most people would call it balance but we're doing it in a time basis. So you, you have this balance between working and resting, between warming and cooling, rising, descending, dissipating, materializing, scattering, congealing, generating, growing, expanding, contracting. And the way that we think about the yin and the yang is that they're not absolute. They depend on the context in which you express them. So when we're talking about illuminating and darkening, well, that has to do with the time of day you're talking about working and resting, then that's in the context of who's working and who's resting. So these things are, are all context dependent. I'm gonna give you now a little bit of uh, Chinese medicine um, and how doctors actually diagnose. And so in the middle, we have now yin yang in the dyad with the normal range. And so you have the blue, which say the yin, and you have the, the um, uh, brown, which is yang, and they alternate. If we go to the upper left, um, here's a case where you have excess yang. And so in this case, there's, there's too much heat and, and the yang is up and you see the bar. So they're out, they're out of, uh, not out of sync with each other, but they're out of balance in this sense. And you can see how that happens. But the situation you see at the upper left would be at noontime. If you come back at midnight, it go down, What's happened is that the, uh, the proportion has changed, but it's shifted all down. 
So on the top one, the yin is normal and the yang is high. In the bottom one, the yang is normal and the yin is low. And so there's this idea of, of full heat and um, normal yin and then consumed yin that happens. And so this is what happens. Um, this is actually a diagnosis I actually got that runs in my family. As my, my son was playing uh, badminton and I went to the Chinese doctor and he says, he's burning himself down. And I go, what's that mean? Well, he has too much energy. And it's like, well, what do you mean too much energy? He has excess yang. So what happens is that he's really, really has a lot of energy at noon, but he collapses later in the day because of that cycle that's happening. So the story, so Keacock Lee is uh, one of the researchers that has written this book on, on the philosophy of Chinese medicine. And, and what she talks about is a doctor who had said that uh, he examined a patient and in effect said he had this sort of condition. And he had this condition in winter. And he said that if, the, if, this, if he doesn't take treatment, he's going to be dead in summer because the world around him has changed. And so having excess heat is not a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Excess heat is not necessarily a problem in, in winter, but when you get to summer, excess heat is a big problem. Now, I'm going to talk just a place Dao Jia in, this, in the uh, frame of philosophy and where this all fits, because there's actually a long history here. So Dao Jia is the philosophy that is in Taoism. There's also Dao Jiao, which is the religion. Um, I'm focused now in the middle. You see the Yin Yang school, which existed from 770 BC to 221 BC. And in that time, there's actually six philosophical lineages, lineages that happen. Um, Simaton is actually uh, AD. He looked back and they said, okay, the, there's Yin Yang, Confucius, Moist, Legalist, School of Names, and Tao. So all these religions were developing. Uh, if you look up at the top, you can kind of place them relative to where all of the classical Western religions happened. Um, but in China, we have the Western Zhou Dynasty, uh, starting at about 1000 BCE and then going to 800. And they have the Eastern um, Zhou Dynasty, where all the action happens, philosophy is in what's called the Warring States period, 475 to 221 BCE. Towards the bottom, uh, in the middle, there's a number of texts that have come out. Now, one of the issues is you, you have to recall that that Chinese writing didn't get standardized until the Qin Dynasty, which is at 221 BCE. So before that, they're actually they're actually hard to trace back and see all the writing. But there's three, um, three philosophers, in effect, Fu Xi, Wang Wing, and Gong Zhou, and they created what was called the Zhou Yi. The Zhou Yi is the predecessor for the Yi Jing, the I Ching, the Book of Changes. And so we started off the System Changes Learning um, Project. First, I said, oh, maybe we should look at the Book of Changes. And it's like, oh, no, no, that's too tough. And then we actually are now, after six years, coming back around and looking at it again. But all of this is uh, trying to separate out the yin yang from the uh, Confucianism that becomes a state, a state philosophy later and the Taoism that comes in very briefly for a period uh, around 700 uh, AD. So there's all this history that's happening, it's all flowing uh, onward. So we're going to break out now for our dialogue. And the question that we'll have, which is uh, I think a pretty challenging question, we should have a good discussion on this, is if we're in a world where we're used to talking about straight lines and point to point, if we're doing organizational change as an example, it's kind of like, okay, we have a state and then we're going to a current state, we're going to have a future state and move from that. Uh, what's it like to be trying to describe things in terms of dyadic rhythms where you have the idea of waxing and waning or dissipating and concentrating and thinking about two as opposed to thinking about one? Okay, so we've uh, covered the section B. We're going to go to section C and talk about uh, a shift from progressive development in cont into contextual threading. So the, the way I've been expressing this with up and down arrows is trying to be um, deprecating of one and then elevating the other. It's not that everything is dyadic or everything is monadic, but what happens when we start from a, a monadic approach 
a linear approach and we it, it puts us in a certain place so in in this section i want to talk about moving out of the idea of progressive development into into contextual threading and that'll take a little bit of an explanation so at the beginning i talked about the different world theories um, organicism frames the world as parts with parts into holes and so here we have assembly of a car uh, which people would say mechanistic. Uh, mechanistic tends to be taking the car apart. Putting the car together, in effect, the car doesn't operate until you put it into a hole. Um, another way of looking at this, though, and the metaphor that I prefer to use for contextualism, um, is think about a couple dancing in a room of people dancing. And so you have two things going on. You still have the dyadic because you've got the person leading and you've got the person following. Um, might be male and female, although I've had a lot of arguments about whether the woman is leading sometimes, but they'll lead each other. It's okay, it's dyadic. Um, but then outside of that, you've got these other people who are dancing and you have two things going on. One is between the partners as they're trying to not step on each other's feet. And then you've also got the other people in the room that you're trying to not run into at the same time. Um, this is probably the best way of expressing the dyadic in a dyadic sense because you've got everything in motion. Now, just drawing this in a static sense, the way we look at yin-yang threads, you can see that you've got the two woven together, is that they, they have the idea of being threads alongside other threads over time that weave into a texture. And so this is now close to the idea that we're talking about with contextualism, that it's a texture, it's like a fabric. Uh, this is based uh, a lot off the work of Tim Ingold, ecological anthropologist, and he talks about lines. He has a book called The Life of Lines. And the way we think about this is that each of us has our own lives, we're on our own lifelines. So today we've come together and we tie a knot. Um, and we're together for this time and we're gonna go away and we, we don't have that knot, we have the knot in our history, so we have that um, in our experience. And as we come, go forward, we'll be independent and then we'll come meet each other in different permutations and some other point in time. But it's the crossing over and the tying of knots and threads that is, is what creates that, that view. Now the difference in this with most system thinking, when you start thinking about threads and textures, traditional system thinking in the West has been about system and boundary. In this case, I'm not talking about system and boundary anymore. I'm, not, I'm talking about threads alongside threads. The threads are in effect holes. So you could also say it's holes alongside holes. So it's a different way of thinking. When we think about living systems, we can often think about transforming and focusing on the unity again. And so here we have a caterpillar going into a cocoon, uh, will come out a butterfly in the end. But there's that idea of staging that happens. And if we use this metaphor, this metaphor is still a unitary metaphor. It doesn't have the dyadic in it. Instead, we could think about um, a school of dolphins swimming together. And they come together. Um, and you know they, 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 they come in parallel paths. They swim together. Sometimes they swim apart and they have that experience together. So this is a, what, an ecological perspective that sees threads corresponding with other threads in time. Now, we think about textures, people tend to think about them at a point in time, but if we could imagine this left-hand side where the threads actually just keep going, they never actually, of course, we have the knots that tie in history, but they, the strands keep going on and on into the future. And a, a way of thinking about dyadic textures is as seasons changing. And so when we think about those about moving in threads, um, the dancing, in effect, you think about dancing in the weather at changes. So when people talk about contextualism, you have at least the seasons that are changing if you don't have all the other people changing around you at the same time. So we're gonna now go into our second dialogue. And the question is, what are the challenges to deprecating or pushing down the ideas of building up parts with parts into holes and coming up with the idea of knitting threads along threads into textures like we have people dancing in couples in a room together?
Okay, so we've covered the yin-yang in the first section. We covered the threads and weaving in the second section. Um, now we get actually into part of the Chinese philosophy, which is about what I'll call subjective initiative, which is now you're talking action, uh, versus situational potential. And there's a, a different approach in that, um, a different philosophy. Where's my mouse? Come on, there it is. Okay. So one of the fundamental things is, coming out of Greek philosophy is this idea of control. And so you're making decisions towards controlling outcomes with action. Um, I have an image here of herding cattle uh, and moving them around. And so that's one way of approaching a social organization is put fences around them and you know tell them this is the direction we're going and this direction is good and that direction is not. There's another one, which is if you take the classical Chinese approach, it's much more about situational timing as favorable or unfavorable. And the metaphor we're using here is angling for fish. So we got some bait actually in the water here. It's this white thing bubbling around. And the uh, question is, uh, the actual original one was, what sort of bait works with these fish? But the fish don't actually seem to be biting. They're kind of nibbling on the side. And so, you know, you actually want, what would be the conditions? What would be the situation? So, oh, we got the fish. <laughs> what would be the situation so that a fish would actually bite and take that hook? So we move from the idea about control to the idea of what is called propensity. Um, Aristotle created the idea of causes and effects and plans and actions. So here we have a billiards table, and this is the way we often think about it, is we take action, we can think ahead, we can create plans, one ball hits another ball, and this is a chain of events. And when you look backwards in time, that's how you can explain it. Looking forwards in time, sometimes it's not so quite so straightforward. If we look at Sun Tzu, um, the question then is looking for conditions when the yin-yang are shifting. Now, we have a rhythm here of a person walking on a beach. And so let's say that that's actually the propensity for the person is that they're just walking along. That's the natural course. They're actually moving and they just keep moving because that's a natural way. But then it's like, is there a stone in the way? Like, are they going to actually stumble or do they have to pay attention to what's happening in front of them? And so the, the difference is cause effect in the Western idea, and then as opposed to being situated for propensity, how is it you set yourself up for success given that you've already got another, another action or other ways, other conditions that are already in motion? Causality directs with what's called Yo Wei, and so we're gonna talk about Wei and Wu Wei, uh, the negative, the, the positive of Wu Wei is Yo Wei. Uh, we have this idea of, virt of, of willful action that we do with force. So one way of approaching a storm, a river that's going to overflow, is to, is to build dikes, is to you know, put sandbags down and actually take direct action. Another way of controlling it, though, would be to work with nature. And so it's a little slower, but... We could, the idea of efficacy in the Chinese philosophy is Wu Wei, which is non obtrusive action. And the propensity of beavers is you put the beavers in and they will build the dams and they will naturally take down the trees and they will actually re sculpt the land for you. And so, you know, should we be thinking more about using nature as opposed to fighting nature? As opposed to using sandbags, you know, could we actually be using beavers in, in changing the way we have the world? Now, we can extend that to the way we think about, um, about uh, managing people. Um, there's two ways. Akoff talks about two ways of thinking about a job. One is that you specify the job, and then you look for the perfect person to fill it. The other way would be you take the person in front of you, and you think about what would this job be like if we hired this person, particularly if you do it at an executive level. So as opposed to saying the perfect CEO is gonna have all these attributes, you could say, well, if we hire this person, this person is going to be very, very uh, financially oriented or very marketing oriented or gonna be controlling or they will, they will naturally take the organization in that way. 
that is a propensity. You can build teams in the same way, which is some people um, like doing routine work, some people like doing new things all the time. If you build a team, don't try to have all the people doing the same thing. Why don't you build a team where people would do, where the team is structured so that people will do naturally what they would want to do anyway? So here's the uh, dialogue we'll have. Uh, we've, we've talked about about uh, yin yang. We've talked about uh, about texture and fabric. Now the question is, can we move this idea from control, the subjective initiative that you take action and you control people, to thinking about the situational potential and when you might do something and what places you would do things? <laughs>